The following accounts have been submitted by military personnel and their family members. These experiences are claimed to describe true events. I ask you to listen in good faith and decide for yourself what to believe. In 2015, I was placed on desk duty in the barracks on a 24-hour rotation, charge quarters as it's officially called. We sat at the desk for 24 hours, from 9am until 9am the following morning, often passing time with books, video games, homework or a movie. This particular duty also requires that we monitor high-risk soldiers that have been confined to their barracks, for posing a risk to others or themselves, but have not yet been psychologically evaluated. We had one recently kicked out soldier in my unit who never should have enlisted. He was an angry, hate-filled individual that never progressed past private second class in his 20 months in uniform. It is rare that someone would be such a low rank for so long. He was a troublemaker. He was also rumoured to have been interested in the occult, and was said to practice rituals and dark magic in the barracks. What I know for a fact, though, was that when he was kicked out, he left his barracks room a complete mess. I've seen portable toilets cleaner than his room. The toilet had been broken and didn't flush, but he had continued to use it. In the closet there were mountains of trash and rotten food in the sink and refrigerator. The shower was also filled with garbage and water. Aside from the mess, there were strange things as well. When the commander, first sergeant and myself, the supply sergeant, went into his room, we found chicken bones tied together hanging from strings from the ceiling. They had been lashed together to make seemingly archaic symbols. We counted roughly two dozen before we quit counting. The floor was covered in grime and candles had been lit in a circle. All of the furniture had been stacked out of the way or shoved in the closet. I'll spare you the description of the smell, but the whole room had an unsettling feeling to it. I joined the military in my late twenties and had a good amount of life experience, including an interest in the occult when I was in my late teens. I wasn't particularly phased by the bones hanging or the candles. It all looked pretty run-of-the-mill nerds in a basement with a paperback edition of the Necronomicon they bought on Amazon, which I voiced to my superiors in the room. But the air in the room felt… wrong. I couldn't tell at the time if it was the smell or the filth. Whatever the reason. I didn't want to be in there. We called a special cleanup team and put in a work order to have the room stripped and cleaned by professionals. After they were finished, the room was spotless. In the months following this dirtbag getting kicked out of the army, the charge quarters on duty would quietly talk about hearing things in his old room, which was unoccupied at the time. Occasionally, reports about the room would be made, something along the lines of, Heard some sort of sound from room such and such. CQ investigates, finds nothing, smells burning plastic, cannot find source, no electrical appliances in room, will monitor and notify my replacement. But overall it was brushed off as immature soldiers spooking new guys. A couple of months into the rumours, my name comes up on the duty roster. It was a Thursday night, the unit is mostly in the field training and my CQ runner, assigned private, and myself are quietly going about our business. The room in question is halfway down a hallway from the front desk. If someone was having a conversation in that room with the door closed, you would never know. Suddenly, we both hear some sort of roar. It didn't sound like a dinosaur from Jurassic Park or something from a video game. This sounded like metal, tearing, while someone played a recording of a scream, except distorted and in reverse. The soldier with me later described it as the loud part of a metal collision, he said car accident when he was asked to clarify, with no build-up or drop-off, just sudden noise. Being the senior ranking, I instructed the soldier to call the barracks representative and have him get to the desk as soon as possible. Five minutes later, he and I are using his master key to gain access to the room while my private covers the hallway from the desk, staying with the phone 
and also watching our backs. As soon as we enter the foyer, we're hit with the smell of dog poo and burned plastic. Neither of us can identify the source, but the room is completely empty. We sweep and clear every nook and cranny, later agreeing that we felt like we were being watched the whole time. We found nothing, but the smell remained. We decided to resecure the room and not log the incident, because I, for one, didn't want to look like a crazy idiot when my boss's boss read my report. We move for the door. We exit, turn, and go to close the door behind us when a massive force hits the door from inside the room, shoving the barracks representative out of the doorway and slamming the door shut. None of the doors are allowed to slam. They all have hydraulic arms at the top to prevent that. They're not even quick to close if a 200 pound male leans on them, so one slamming so hard it could move a grown man is impossible, especially considering it had worked moments prior when we entered the room. We tried to open the lock again, but this time the keycard wouldn't work. We agreed that neither of us wanted to go in again anyway, and we agreed not to report any of it, because we would be taken as seriously as anyone else. After that incident, I kept an ear out, but didn't hear anything nearly as dramatic again. On another occasion, it sounded like there was some kind of shuffling coming from the room, like someone moving around, but I kept a stalwart face about it, and ordered my private to stay away from it as well. To this day, I cannot explain what happened in that room. My uncle Bob was in the army. Last Thanksgiving he got drunk and told us all the story that shocked me. It was around 1985, and he was still new to the army, only being about three years in. He was on patrol duty on a base in Arizona. It was late, and he and another guy were walking along the fence line. Bob and the other guy were focused on the other side of the fence, when they heard a sound behind them. It was coming from the inside, from their side of the fence. When they turned around, they saw an old man dressed in buckskin, with long hair in braids. Bob described it as being so grey that it almost glowed. The man was standing approximately 30 feet behind them. Both men drew their weapons, as the old man was in a shoot-to-kill area, with warning signs all over the place. Neither Bob or the other man wanted to shoot an old man. They figured that he must have Alzheimer's and had wandered into the base or something like that. After all, he was not being threatening and appeared harmless. The men shouted to the old man, telling him he was in a restricted area and that he needed to put his hands in the air. Bob thought they'd walk him to post call and call the local police department who would be able to get him back home. Bob tried the radio, but it was just static. Calling his friend to help, both he and Bob turned to tinker with the walkie. Although they only looked away for half a second, to quote my uncle, when they turned back, the old man was gone. In his place was a massive cottontail, just sitting there, watching them. Both men looked around, right to left and back again to see where the old man had wandered off to, but he was nowhere to be seen. In that time, the cottontail took off towards the fence. Again, they heard a noise behind them. When they turned around, the same as last time, the old man was there. This time, however, he was on the outside of the fence. The fence was a good eight to ten feet tall. There was no way this old man could have jumped it. Bob described how that sent he and his buddy off running. They agreed not to tell their commander. Keep in mind that my uncle was drunk, but despite over 30 years having passed since that night, he still looked scared as hell when he told us that he had seen a skinwalker. My name is Adolf Schaefer. I am currently rank Felderbur, the equivalent of Sergeant in the Bundeswehr. I am not easily scared. When my experience occurred, I was a cadet in boot camp in East Germany. It was around five in the afternoon. We were doing drill courses whilst the base was having technical problems with the electric grid 
which was uncommon considering it had just been inspected days earlier, and nothing I noticed that time was really that odd. Except, a few of us kept hearing these eerie, unexplainable noises coming from one of the head buildings nearby, where the water is kept during five minute breaks. But skip ahead a few hours to around eight o'clock. The power was going in and out again, and the drill sergeant had told me and three others to go and fix it. So, me and the others grabbed flashlights and tools, and went to the basement where the generators are located. We found the first backup generator, and it was turned off, but operable, as expected. It was the same with the second generator. The third generator was the largest main source of power in the base. The first thing I noticed were the scratches. This seemingly super hard to break hunk of metal had what I think were scratches and cuts, claw marks, piercing its outer metal shell like a buzzsaw. So deep, the scratches had cut the cords inside and had damaged the batteries as though they were paper. After a moment of thinking, I knew this couldn't have been a person doing this, seeing as nothing any cadet had could cut through that tough metal so easily. I immediately rushed up the stairs to tell my drill sergeant, hoping he would know what to do. He told me the most we can do is tell base command and put someone to guard the door, and have the generator replaced. Good thing reporting this, Cadet Schaefer. After getting a pat on the back, I resumed my daily training routines without anything too odd happening. But some hours later, sometime in the night, I can't be exactly sure when, I heard scratching noises but not from the basement. They were too close and too loud, as if they were in the sleeping quarters. After that moment of realization, I opened my eyes and looked around. I saw what I thought was someone in the corner, going through a bag, but when I looked around the room, sheer terror came into me. All the bunks were full, every one. Wait, the hell? I thought to myself. But then, as if it had heard what I was thinking, the thing in the corner turned to face me. It was a pale grey, with no nose, and claws like razors. This thing was skinny and two feet taller than my six foot self. After that, I just froze in a blank stare of horror. In my mind, seconds turned to minutes, minutes turned to hours, and hours turned to days. I think I passed out of terror, because all I remember after that is waking up to my buddies and sergeant looking at me, while talking to me, telling me I looked sick. And I felt sick too, like all energy from me was drained for days on end. I swear, during my entire military career, I have never been so afraid since that night. My dad is in the army. Because of this, I've lived in various different army bases. Several of the bases have been haunted. The first time I experienced something paranormal was at Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri. At the time, I was about 10 or 11 years old and would often visit my friend's house. Every time I visited, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. When I was there, inexplicable things would happen. Sometimes, Xbox controllers would fly off my friend's bed and across his bedroom. Other times, the TV would flicker on and off by itself. By far the scariest experience there was when I opened a pantry door and a Tupperware bowl flew out and into the wall on the other side of the kitchen. There was nothing obvious to suggest why this happened. Nothing was stacked up or cramped to cause it to move. Besides, the bowl didn't fall, it was thrown. However, it was what happened in Kansas, at Fort Leavenworth, that I remember most vividly. The military base is well known for being haunted, and is sometimes referred to as the most paranormally active in the country. The base is home to the Fort Leavenworth National Graveyard. It is very large and takes up a good amount of the base. One night, I was riding my bike to my friends on the sidewalk that ran alongside the graveyard. As it was summertime, it didn't get dark until very late. The sun had set, and there was only about 15 minutes of sunlight left before darkness set in. 
Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man walking in the graveyard. This surprised me, as not many people visited the graveyard, and definitely not this late. I slowed down to look at the man closer. That was when I realized he wasn't a man. He was dressed in an old military uniform and walked slowly. In fact, it was more like he was gliding across the yard. One thing which struck me was that he had a mist around him. His form had a strange quality to it. He appeared translucent and undefined. His shape seemed to change slightly, and I could see through him. Paused on the sidewalk with my bike, I watched him for about two minutes. Occasionally, he would stop to look at a grave. I knew my eyes weren't playing tricks on me, as when he kneeled next to a grave, I could faintly see the outline of the grave through him. Eventually, he stood up from one grave and walked away from me, and up the hill. He got more and more translucent the further away he walked. In no way was he hostile towards me, or seemed like he wanted to harm anyone. As he did not carry a gun or a backpack, I believe he was in his dress uniform. This led me to speculate that I had seen the spirit of a man who did not die in the war, but lived through it, and was now visiting the graves of his friends. I was very shaken up after that experience, because I have never seen a ghost before. To see something like that affects you. It is hard to describe, but I know that I will never forget that experience. The following accounts have been submitted by subscribers. These experiences are claimed to describe true events. I ask you to listen in good faith and decide for yourself what to believe. My experience began in 2007. My family had just moved into a trailer in rural Indiana. At the time I was 15 and had been in protest of our move feeling as though I was being torn away from my friends and life in the town we were moving from. From about October to December of that year, I delayed enrolling at the school and stayed at home in a bout of depression. During this time, I had vivid dreams of a girl. Each time she was in a car that had recently crashed and was screaming for help, begging me to help her. I ran and ran towards the car in my dream, but it was like my feet were stuck in the mud. The dreams were so real, that I can remember every detail of them to this day. Once I began attending the local high school, I started dating an older girl and would frequently ride with her to school in the morning. One day, as we were riding along one of the country roads, I had her pull over. I had begun to feel immensely ill and needed to vomit. After I did so, I asked her to drive me back home, which she did. Yet, not five seconds after we turned around, I noticed something I hadn't before in her car. Hanging from the rearview mirror was a memorial picture of a girl. The girl from my dreams. My blood went cold, and I am sure that my already pale skin grew even paler. I began to tear up. My girlfriend noticed my physical discomfort and asked if I was okay. I snatched the photo from the mirror and asked who the girl was. A little scared by my sudden franticness, my girlfriend told me that it was a close friend of hers, who had died about two months before I started going to school. She told me that she had been in a car accident. I asked her if she recalled me telling her about my dreams, and she finally put two and two together. We were both shocked. It turns out that the girl who had passed away in the car accident had lived in my house, in the same room as me, and had moved out with her family only a week or two before her death. Over six months passed. During that time, me and my girlfriend broke up. My older brother and I also switched bedrooms, for he had a friend who moved in with us, as he and her started attending the same college, and I had the larger room. It was during these months that noises began to be heard about the house. At first, they were minor, and did nothing to terrify us. Once, when I was still in my original bedroom, I thought I heard a girl laughing. Almost three months after my brother's friend moved in, I was awoken when her and my brother burst into my room. Together, they explained that they had heard a girl laughing in the bedroom. They were both visibly shaken. I remember we all kind of slept sideways in my twin-sized bed that night. 
A few more months went by and his friend moved out due to some personal reasons. My brother immediately demanded that I switch rooms with him again, which I did. By now I was almost 17 and loved the idea of having the bigger room, even if it seemed to be a bit haunted. After I moved back in, that's when things started to get worse. Every night it seemed that my closet door would open by itself. Sometimes I would place a clothes basket in front of the door, just in case it was a draft causing it, but the door would still open, the basket moved away from it. I began to wake at 2.55am on the dot every morning, something that had never happened to me before. About a week into the awakenings, a small earthquake hit our area at exactly 2.55am. At the time, I took this as a sign that whatever was in the room with me wanted to warn me, but I was wrong. About a year into sleeping in that room, I was diagnosed with insomnia and paranoid personality disorder. Both seemed to pop up out of nowhere. When I did sleep, I had dreams of dark figures waiting for me at every turn. My parents thought it was the PPD, but I knew it wasn't. It was something to do with that house. That room. To make matters worse, my brother had moved out the previous year to get out on his own, so I felt alone in this. I couldn't help but think there must have been a good reason why he was so keen to swap rooms again after his friend moved out. Then, one day, out of nowhere, the dream stopped. Everything was normal again. During this period, I became a father, graduated high school, and soon started working to support my son. Things stayed quiet like this for about two and a half years. I worked a lot and only stayed home on occasion. For a time, I moved out on my own. Whatever lurked in that house couldn't reach me when I was away. I truly believed that whatever this entity was, it thrived on emotional manipulation, with me as its target. When I was away, I was relatively safe. Eventually though, I had to move back in with my parents. This is when things started picking up again, and came to their climax. One day, I was approaching the house with my son holding his hand. My mother rushed outside to greet him, and we all came in and settled in for his visit. It was then that he asked me, Daddy, who was that girl? I asked him, what girl? And he said there had been a girl at the door. He told me that she had waved at me through the glass screen door. I immediately thought he meant my mother, as there was no other girl in the house, so I ignored it at the time. Now, in hindsight, I am not so sure what he saw. After that time, I continued to experience strange things in the house. They seemed to intensify, morphing from strange sounds, even strange sights, to physical encounters. I started dating a young woman who moved in with me after a few months of dating. My room was being carpeted, so we were sleeping on a pull-out couch in the living room. One night, as I was returning to the pull-out, I felt as though something was standing behind me, with its arms outstretched to grab me. I jumped into the bed, feeling as though I had barely escaped its outstretched arms, to find my girlfriend physically shaking. When I asked her what was wrong, she told me that someone had been standing behind me. Once we moved back into my bedroom, things got even worse. At night, half asleep, half awake, I would see a dark figure moving from my closet next to my bed. One night, it went a step further and began to choke me. I was physically gasping for air, unable to move, barely able to breathe. I would describe it as sleep paralysis, but I am certain that it was real. My girlfriend woke up, suddenly sitting up, knocking whatever the shadow was off me into the darkness. She had seen it too, but unlike myself, she was wide awake. Unless we had both hallucinated the same thing, I have no choice but to conclude the dark shadow was really there. Afterwards, we left the trailer just as my brother moved in with his boyfriend. About a year or two later, they told me about their experiences. After I left, things got even worse. The bathroom light would flicker on and off each time they went in there. If my brother acknowledged it and asked it to stop, it only got worse. They experienced physical attacks. My brother's hair was pulled. He even had something grab him as he reached into his closet to get a shirt. One night, they heard sobbing coming from my old bedroom. When they opened the door, a shrill screech sounded out. The closet door flung open and the scream continued. They told me that it sounded like nails being dragged against the wall. The sound circled the room and then out the window. After that, the activity stopped. 
they moved out soon after when my father left the house as well. To this day, we have no idea what was in that trailer. It took many shapes, the girl in the crash, a shadowy figure, and even the girl my son saw waving at me from the door. We just called it the shapeshifter. Whatever it was, it tortured me from the time I was 15 until I was 22. I am glad to be away from it, because whatever it was, it was feeding on me. I was born in 1979 in New Mexico. Growing up, I had my sister, Jessica, who was 18 months older, but I remember seeing another child with us. I have a few vague memories of another little girl in my house. She was often in the room with my sister and me. I remember looking for her whenever she was not present. I don't think I could even talk yet during the time she was with me. I don't remember when I stopped seeing her, and I don't believe I ever talked about her to my sister. I simply forgot about her as I grew older. It wasn't until I was in college that I learned the dramatic story of my mother's pregnancy. I was home for the summer after my freshman year, and my family and I were sitting at a restaurant. Seemingly out of nowhere, my mom started talking about her pregnancy complications whilst I was in utero. I had heard part of this story before, but she had not told me everything. She went on recalling that when I was about four months gestated, she and my father had gone on a fishing trip, and she started hemorrhaging. Badly. My dad raced her to the hospital, talking to the police on his CB radio, to alert authorities about this emergency. After they arrived and my mom was evaluated, the doctor told her that she had miscarried, and nothing else could be done. I had no heartbeat. They scheduled a DNC to remove any remaining fetal tissue, and my mom was sent home to mourn and wait a week until the procedure. A week later, my parents returned to the hospital. Just before the procedure, the doctor was examining my mom and found a heartbeat. It was faint, but it was there. He advised my mom to proceed with the DNC anyway, though now it would qualify as an abortion. The doctor stated that I had gone without a heartbeat for a sustained amount of time, and that I would be brain dead at best if I even survived a full term. Furthermore, he said a child like this would be completely dependent on full-time care and would ruin her life. My mom refused to terminate the pregnancy. The doctor then advised her not to tell her family that the child she was carrying would be severely disabled. She didn't tell anybody about his predictions and had no further complications during the pregnancy. When I was born and was perfectly healthy, it was considered a medical miracle. I knew most of this story already. What I didn't know and learned while sitting in that restaurant was that my mom did miscarry. She had conceived twins. She didn't know she was pregnant with twins until she lost one, but was told that she lost them both. The ultrasound had confirmed that both fetuses had died, but somehow I came back. These missing details made so much sense to me, the little girl I remember seeing and searching for, and perhaps even why I've seen and experienced otherworldly beings and phenomena my entire life. I've been to the other side. When I returned to college in the fall, I began studying twins, and learned of the term for Piscus, meaning the sole survivor of a twinship. I have never seen my twin again, though I encounter other beings on a regular basis. When I was pregnant with my daughter in 2005, I saw an extra child at a Christmas party. I was in the living room of a dear friend's mother's house when a group of little boys ran into the room. They were running in a circle in front of me. There were four boys, Jake, Ian, Luke, and another. He was staring at me, smiling kindly. Two of the boys' fathers were close by, so I asked them, who is that little boy? They both laughed and disregarded the question. Perhaps they thought I was making a statement about how much the boys had grown since I had last seen them, making them unrecognizable. The two fathers returned to their conversation when I stopped them again. No, really, who is that? I asked and pointed to the fourth boy who was still smiling at me. He appeared to me to be the same age as Jake, with strikingly similar features, but clearly wearing clothes different from Jake's, and paying attention to me whereas Jake was busy playing with the other boys. The two fathers didn't reply to my second inquiry, and the fourth boy started to leave the room, still looking at me, so I followed him. He walked into an empty bedroom. I stood in the doorway, watching whilst he walked around the bed, and right into the wall. He vanished right into the wall. 
I ran around the bed, he wasn't under it or anywhere else. I am certain that I felt an energy shift in the room, and after a few moments I returned to the party without saying another word about this extra child. For the next few days I pondered this extra child and thought of the girl I grew up seeing, that I learned was quite possibly my twin. Perhaps he too was a missing twin. Even though it's been a few decades since this happened, I can remember it all as if it happened yesterday. I was 10 or 11 years old, so it would have been around 1978 or 1979. When I was younger, I was involved with the church, and this happened one Sunday morning whilst I was helping set up for mass. I was the only one in the building when I heard a loud bang coming from the choir loft at the other end of the building. Curious, I stepped out from where I was and called out hello. There was no answer. I figured that the person just didn't hear me and was just doing what they needed to do to get ready. I looked up towards the choir loft to see if I could see the person, but there was no one there. Something must have just fallen down, I thought, causing the noise to echo throughout the church. I was just going through the normal, rational ideas to come up with for a reason for what I had just heard. Right then and there, however, I had a feeling that I wasn't alone. Normally I wouldn't have minded, on any other day it would have just been the organist coming in early to get ready, but this was different. I had this uneasy feeling that not only was my life in jeopardy, but my soul. It was a fear that I've never felt before or since. Even at that young age, I could tell when my imagination was getting out of control. This was not one of those times. As I was looking up at the choir loft, although I couldn't see anyone, I could sense that there was something up there. An entity of some kind. It then appeared to me. It was a shapeless and formless figure, and it was exuding or giving off an evil that penetrated through me like sound would at a concert if you were standing too close to the amps. The entity seemed to turn around to face me, almost as though it was staring at me. What I felt went way beyond the fight or flight reaction people talk about when faced with a situation like this. I was frozen there, beyond being scared, and my mind didn't process things for a few seconds. Then, all of a sudden, my mind snapped back to reality and I just ran and took off out of the church. I stayed outside until I saw the priest leave the rectory and head in the direction of the church. I didn't realise just how far I ran until I started walking back to the church. I had run about 100 to 150 feet from the church. When the priest saw me fully dressed to take part in the mass, yet shaken and freaked out, he asked me what had happened. I told him what I had seen and felt. I asked him if he knew of anybody else having a similar experience but he didn't give me a straight out confirmation or denial. Instead, he tried to reassure me that it was probably my imagination, that it was an old church and it might just have been something falling or something mechanical. Yet, I had and have been in that building long enough to know the sounds of the mechanical devices when they kick on and off, and as I said, I know when something is my imagination and when something isn't. My imagination wouldn't have given me that life-threatening feeling or the very real sensation of being able to tell that there was something giving off such evil that it reverberated throughout my body. I've always been a sceptical person, even at that young age. I never let my mind get the better of me. I've never lost my faith in God and his advisory, and I feel that that's what this was. Some kind of evil spirit, or demon. Since that day, whenever I went into that church again, I've always made sure that there would be someone else there so that I wouldn't have to come across that thing again. Many years ago, I was attending an elementary school in Michigan. Back then, I was completely obsessed with animals, so I used to enjoy flipping over logs and large rocks just to see what kinds of interesting little critters lay underneath. During recess, I would spend most of my time exploring the grassy hills towards the south end of the schoolyard. This area was positioned very close to a busy road, but for some reason there wasn't a fence that separated the road from the playground. I always found this strange because someone could probably just run away if they wanted to. I guess the school figured that no one would go up there. 
Every so often whilst I was up there by myself, I would notice the fuzzy silhouette of a person running very fast only several meters away. Usually I would see this out of the corner of my eye, but there were a few times where I was looking at it directly. It didn't make any noise whatsoever. It just quickly ran up the steep hill and onto the road, and then sort of just faded away. One second it was there, and the next it had vanished without a trace. This never frightened me. In fact, I rarely even paid attention to it after a while. As a child, I just assumed that it was completely normal for people to see things like this, which is why I never brought it up to anyone. Fast forward a couple of years later to fifth grade. One of my teachers was giving her class a lecture about the consequences of bullying. She explained to us how you never truly know what someone else might be feeling, and one day you might just push that person over the edge, or you might accidentally do something that you will regret for the rest of your life. She ended the lecture with a story from when she was in elementary school. She told us that she had attended this very elementary school when she was a child. She remembered a young boy named Cody. Sadly, he was a constant victim of bullying. Kids used to beat him up on his way to class. They'd make up false stories just to get him in trouble. One day, another kid was pressured into bullying Cody during recess. This kid had never bullied anyone before in his life. However, his friends warned him that if he didn't torment Cody, they would spread rumors about him and bully him in turn. So, the kid made his choice. He grabbed a large plastic bucket from the storage shed and filled it up with some nasty water from a nearby stagnant pond, which was likely infested with parasites. He then walked over to Cody and began chasing him across the schoolyard, threatening to dump the bucket on him if he tripped. Cody ran for his life, terrified of what might happen if the bully caught up to him. He stumbled up the grassy hill as fast as his legs would carry him, and then turned around to look back upon his pursuer. He yelled out for help as the kid continued to chase him up the hill and begged the bully to leave him alone whilst continuing to sprint out onto the road. The bully stopped dead in his tracks, and before Cody could react, he was hit by an oncoming car. Cody was killed instantly. Flowers were placed by the road for months afterwards. Cody's parents were never the same again after that. How could they be? They had lost their only child. The kid who chased Cody into the street was absolutely devastated. The guilt he experienced followed him everywhere he went, until he finally ended his own life, several weeks before graduating from high school. By the time my teacher had finished telling his story, I was completely in tears. I couldn't wrap my head around such an awful tale. I remember thinking about all the times I've seen kids get bullied at the school. The worst part of all was that despite the tragedy of the story, there were several kids who were laughing while my teacher was telling it. Before I left to go home that day, I walked up to the top of that hill one last time to say a prayer for Cody. After that, I never returned to that hill again. I just hope that poor boy is finally at peace now. I am 34 years old and live in an older house with my father in northern New Jersey. When we first started renting this place, about a year and a half ago, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, that is, until strange things started to unfold one by one. Items misplaced, electronics turning on and off by themselves, the dog acting out of character, and other, scarier things. We've had so many strange things happen since we moved in, it would be impossible to sit and write them all down. The first incident happened about a week or so after moving in. I was home one day by myself, simply washing dishes. I was standing in the kitchen with my back towards the open area of the kitchen and the doorway leading into the living room. There was no one else in the house but me. At least, that is what I thought. You know that feeling you get when someone suddenly walks into a room that you're currently in, or that feeling you get when you feel someone is right behind you. I just could not shake this disturbing feeling. I was in the middle of washing a dish. I felt instantly compelled to turn my head around, only to see no one there. The first two or three times it happened, I attempted to quietly laugh it off. I would continue washing, but something kept forcing me to turn my head around. It was a feeling I've never felt before. It became so impossible to ignore that I actually got quite spooked. 
I could feel my eyes resting tightly to the far right of my sockets. I was expecting someone, anyone, to be standing right there behind me with each turn of my head. I thought I was losing my mind. Eventually, I couldn't bring myself to continue what I was doing. I shut off the water, dried my hands and abandoned the sink of remaining dirty dishes. Shutting the door to my bedroom, I sat there, unable to shake the feeling. Of course, at the time, I didn't blame this event on anything other than my own imagination. But before too long, other things began to happen in the house that made me question what was truly going on. One day, I accidentally left my phone home for a couple of hours while I was out. This never happens, being out without my cell phone is like being in public wearing only a shoe. But on this particular day, my phone just happened to be accidentally left on my bed under my sheets and blanket. My father was also at work all day long. My phone and I were happily reunited that evening. Later that night, I was lying in bed and decided to skim through social media and clean out some useless photos and videos. That's when I noticed it. While closing my apps before putting it on the charger before going to sleep, I saw that there was a new entry on the voice recording app. I was a little confused at first. It was the same date as that day. As I hadn't had my phone all afternoon, I knew that I hadn't recorded anything all day. I looked at the timestamp, 1.14pm, recording, 54 minutes and 2 seconds. What? I said to myself. I played it back. I could hear background noise coming from the pavement company's yard down the street. They're very loud while loading and unloading gravel, and after living here, I can't forget that sound even if I wanted to. I knew right away that the recording was coming from inside my own house, but I hadn't been at home at that time. No one was. Except, my phone had definitely been here, on my bed. I couldn't really make out any interesting sounds on the recording, other than some birds nearby, the house phone ringing once or twice, and the dog barking. I did notice something peculiar though. I thought I heard sink forces turning on and off inside the empty house. I could even hear the water running for a brief moment. I couldn't find an answer for it. I figured some sort of glitch set it off. Soon, I forgot about it. On another occasion a few months later, I happened to be out of town for work so my dad was home alone this time. Upon my arrival back in town, I made plans to meet my father for lunch. He was already out of the house running some errands, so I told him I would stop home first, then I would meet him for a bite to eat at a nearby restaurant. When I entered the house, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. I brought the luggage in and stepped into the bathroom before heading on my way out. I noticed the picture frame that hangs on the wall there besides the sink was standing on the floor below, leaning up against the wall. I brushed it off and assumed it must have fell while I was gone and my dad just hadn't got round to putting it back up. Anyway, I just left it there and decided to wait until we got back home to deal with it. It was about an 11 by 14 sized photo frame, so nothing major. After that, I met up with my dad for lunch as planned. When we were finished eating, I decided to stop at the local grocery store for a couple of things while my dad headed straight home in the other car. As I walked down the aisle in the store, I got a phone call from my dad. This is how the conversation went. Hi honey, why are the pictures on the floor? My dad asked. I replied, oh, you mean the one in the bathroom? I forgot I was actually going to ask you about that. I thought you knew about it. It must have fell down off the wall. What my dad said next chilled me. Bathroom? No, I'm talking about the pictures in the living room. I walked through the front door and the walls were empty. That's when I noticed that all three living room frames were on the floor. I told him not to touch anything until I got home because I wanted to see exactly what he was talking about. And sure enough, each frame was on the floor underneath its original spot, neatly leaning up against the wall, exactly the same way as the bathroom picture that I found earlier in the day. Only, the frames in the living room were not small like in the bathroom. All three of them are very large in size and extremely thick and heavy. One is well over four feet wide. Should any of them fall down, just the weight of them alone would shatter all of its glass and cause noticeable damage, either to their frame or to the polished wood floor. But each one was neatly propped up on the floor against each wall. I cannot lift these frames alone by myself easily, and my dad is not the type to even think up a practical joke such as this. He was more annoyed that he had to put them back up. 
After he and I unsuccessfully tried to figure out what could have caused these to come down from their walls, I went to go to my bedroom to get ready for bed. As I opened the door, I felt a little bit of a struggle. Suddenly, there was a loud crash. When I turned the light on, I saw my long dressing mirror that hangs on the back of the door was in large pieces on the floor. After putting two and two together, I came to realise the eerie truth that my mirror was also taken down from behind the door, and had been leaning up against where it once hung. It had broken when I tried to open the door upon which it rested. What creeps me out the most, even now, is the fact that my bedroom door would have had to have stayed shut for this mirror to have come off and be placed up against it to lean without falling. My windows are locked shut, and no one can reach them from outside as they would just drop to the ground from a higher level. It was as if whoever took my mirror down was still in my room with me. Needless to say, I didn't sleep in my room that night. In the months that followed, it was difficult not to dwell on these inexplicable occurrences and feelings. As I mentioned at the start, these things were only a few of those my father and I have experienced in the house. Each time something happened, it seemed to get creepier and creepier. There are just some things that you will never forget. For me, it was the night I am about to describe. Somewhat recently, I was asleep in my room. It was about 3am and I was sound asleep before being woken by a tap on my window. I sat up and leaned over to take a look out of the window through my blinds. There was nothing there. As I was drifting back to sleep, the tapping began again. I opened my eyes again and sat up. There was a girl sitting on the bottom edge of my bed. What happened next was not sleep paralysis. Don't get me wrong, sleep paralysis is a very real and scary thing. I have experienced it multiple times. However, this was noticeably different. I was alert, awake and able to move. This was real. The girl had to be no more than 11 or 12 years old. She had dark hair just below shoulder length with bangs. She was wearing a nightgown, but you could tell it was outdated from years ago. Ivory coloured, long sleeves a soft, flat collar around the neck. I could see everything about her in great detail. Everything apart from her face. I know it all sounds so cliché, and I wish I could say it was something different, but that's exactly what it was. She sat there, her head facing directly towards me, but too dark for me to make out any features of her face. I saw nothing but darkness where her eyes, nose, mouth, chin and cheeks should be. Clearly, however, she was watching me. I was also aware of another, much more mature presence to the right of me, in the direction of where my window was, and the corner of my room where it was very dark. I couldn't even tell if the presence was felt from inside my room in the dark corner, or from the window where the tapping first began. I was so scared at that point that I was too afraid to even turn my head in that direction, to see what it may have looked like. In all honesty, I was afraid of possibly seeing something that didn't look quite as innocent as this little girl. I do remember quickly glancing across the room and realising that since the hanging mirror behind my closed door was now missing, its absence eliminated any option of me being able to see the reflection of whatever this second presence was to the right of me. I still tell myself today that maybe it was better that I didn't see it. It was completely silent in my room. No noise whatsoever. Still, I could tell that the two of them were communicating with each other. I could also tell that they were definitely speaking about me. There was nothing physical, no noise or movement that told me a communication was happening. I just knew it. I felt that that girl was not alone, and that she was communicating in some unknown way with another entity that was closely present. Of all my experiences, this is something which is very difficult for me to explain to others. I believe that one has to experience it for themselves to truly understand. At the time, my imagination was going wild. What were their intentions? Why were they discussing me? Who are they? I felt a tear roll down my cheek. I couldn't even blink, I was so scared. This young girl sitting on the edge of my bed was absolutely still. No muscle movement, no sign of breath, and she was just barely an apparition very real looking, but my eyes were confident that she was not of this realm. 
All the while, the features of her face eluded me. Only darkness. Yet, she was so focused on me, and I knew that. After what felt like an eternity, she finally made a sudden move which made my heart jump into my throat. Even though I'm not sure whether she was about to stand up or scoot closer to me, I automatically felt threatened in some way, and naturally assumed that she was coming closer. I immediately covered my ears, shut my eyes tight, and screamed, STOP! Very slowly, I uncovered my ears and opened my eyes. I could hear crickets again in the backyard, alongside the sound of my own heart beating out of my chest. The girl and the other entity were gone. I turned on the lamp and started sobbing. Currently, my father and I are looking for a new place to rent. Every summer, I go back to my birth country, Japan, to visit my grandmother and the rest of the family with my mother. My grandmother resides on the eastern side of the country, and lives in an old and rundown house that she grew up in as a young girl. My gran has a habit of collecting antiques, objects like katanas, vases, kimonos, and geisha dolls. During this particular visit, we were all sitting together in the living room, chatting around the table. My grandmother realized that she had accidentally left one of her katanas out, so asked me to put it down in the basement, as she didn't want my little cousins playing with it. As the house was very old, the basement naturally gave me the creeps. The fact that it only had one dim source of light scared me even more. Grabbing the katana and a flashlight, I made my way down the stairs, cautiously moving around the junk that seemed to tower from every corner. As I said, my grandmother has a habit of collecting. Eventually, I found a box to place the antique sword. I turned to leave, when I heard a sharp gasp along with a gargle sound. A voice then whispered, Get out! in my native tongue. My heart dropped and I was frozen in place. I was too petrified to move. The voice sounded like that of a young woman, choking and desperately trying to breathe. My paralysis was broken when I heard heavy footsteps charge and knock over a tall box that was right above me. I instantly ran out of there, slamming the basement door shut as tight as I could on the way out. Returning to the room, some of my relatives gave me odd looks when they saw that I was out of breath, and commented that I looked as if I had just seen a ghost. Going to my grandmother, I told her what had just happened. I asked her if she knew about it, and if she even believed me. What she said chilled me to the bone. My grandmother smiled and said, It was my sister, trying to say hello. My grandmother had a young sister named Keiko, who had committed suicide in the house's basement after having her heart broken at a young age. She would have done absolutely anything for her boyfriend, but he did not share the same passion. When she found out that he had cheated, she saw no reason to live anymore. I asked my mother how my great aunt had passed, but she wouldn't answer, telling me that I'm only a teenager and don't need to worry about such bad things. After being in the basement, however, I feel like I already know the answer. I assume she hung herself, and the sounds I heard that day were those of her final, tragic moments. Since I was 16, I have had a fascination with the paranormal. I read books and watch videos, eagerly dissecting the stories and cases to see if I can work out whether or not they are real. I guess that is due in part to my own paranormal experience that occurred when I was 18. Some friends and I used to gather around at a bookstore in the evenings every weekend to discuss art and visit cemeteries. During one of these conversations, we learned about an abandoned asylum that is parallel to the biggest cemetery in the area. Naturally, we were intrigued. Putting on our investigative caps, we decided to venture out and check out the cemetery for ourselves. When we arrived at the cemetery, we immediately began smelling something strange. If I had to say what it was, I would say it was sulfur. It sounds cliché, but the smell was strong and coming from the vents under the streets. It could be smelled all across the cemetery. As we started investigating, my friends and I thought it was the beginning of a horror movie. We found broken tombstones, abandoned mausoleums, and very untidy graves. 
the whole site was a mess. As I began looking around one of the mausoleums, I could not shake the feeling that we were being watched. One of my friends began feeling it too. It was then that we began noticing shadows. Shadows that seemed to lurk and peek over the tombstones. At first glance, they seemed to be translucent, but once you fixed your eyes on them, they were very black. So black that it was almost as if staring into a pit of darkness. And they were everywhere around us. Far from being a trick of the eye, they could be seen by all of us. No one wanted to walk through them. Some of the shapes were human, but some were not. Some seemed to have horns, inhuman shadows that looked as though, if we had touched them, we would not have left that place the same. Their bodies seemed to be slanted and elongated, as if they had once been human, but had changed. These ones were even darker than the others. The whole graveyard was active with shadow entities. By now, the sensation of being watched was unbearable. Not that any of the entities were violent towards us. No, they just observed, watching to see what we were going to do next, to see if we were going to make the wrong move. My friends and I wanted to leave. The final warning was when we saw a child sitting on top of our car. He had a look on his face that told us it was time to go. As we gathered everyone together, we noticed that the car had been pushed from its original place and moved forward. None of us had done this, and it felt like another message that it was time for us to leave the cemetery. Startled, we drove away from the area. Undoubtedly, we had experienced more than we had expected. After a short distance, we were pulled over by a cop. He wondered what we were doing out in that location. After explaining to him why we were there, he began to tell us about the place's history. Apparently, the cemetery had been vandalized countless times, to the point where police had to monitor the area. At once, it made sense to me. It was as though the shadow entities we had seen that night had been watching over their already violated resting places, waiting to see if we would add to the destruction. Hovering over their broken tombstones, once human in form, but now morphed by anger and hatred for the ones who had abused their final resting place. To this day, visiting that graveyard has been the most bizarre paranormal incident I have ever come across. Most of my life, I have lived in Russia. When I was a kid, I was surrounded by old fairy tales and stories of pagan origin. TV, books, bedtime stories all spoke of things like Baba Yaga, a witch of the forest that personified the chaotic side of nature, or of Vodinoy, the king of rivers who took drowned women as wives. When I grew up, I realized that these stories weren't always just fairy tales. When it all happened, I was already a young adult with absolutely zero interest in anything but travel and experiencing other cultures. In between my adventures, I returned to Moscow and stayed with my family. It was just me, my mother and my sister. One day, my mother decided she wanted to move some things around in her room. We moved the bed and placed a closet in its place. We put a big comfortable chair in the corner and moved other bits of furniture and objects as well. It took a while, but her room felt more comfortable afterwards. That night, I stayed up for longer than usual. I was watching something on TV when I suddenly heard a scream. It wasn't a long, horrible sound like in movies. Instead, it was a short yell with a note of fear to it. I hurried to my mother's room. She was there hugging my sister, trying to comfort her. I was told that she just had a nightmare. Thinking that it was normal for a kid her age to have a nightmare, especially after things were moved so drastically in her room, I went to bed myself. It should have ended there, but the next night I was woken up by my sister screaming for a second time. The next night, it happened again, then again, then again. My mother is not a very spiritual person. It was my opinion that she blocked her own abilities with certain beliefs and ignorance. But even she was a little taken back when my sister finally managed to explain that every night she was woken up by a giant snake that slithered at her feet. I had been a witness to several paranormal incidents in the past, so I had no problem believing in the possibility of a spirit lingering in our apartment. I waited for a moment when my house was empty, and then walked to the centre of it. I spoke up, 
loud and clear, demanding that my sister should be left alone. If not, I said, I would do everything in my power to clear whatever was tormenting her out of the house. There was no answer. Well, not until the night came. My sister's scream woke me up again. I stood up from my bed, and as I was about to leave my room, my door slammed shut with so much force that the wooden door frame cracked. I opened it, feeling rather angry, and hurried to my family. The same story played out, only this time my mother finally admitted that this wasn't normal. She turned to me, and asked me to deal with it, somehow. I'm not a religious person, however to tell you the truth, I did think to call a priest and bless my apartment. But what good would it have done, considering I so strongly believed that their holy water had the same properties as the water we had in the sink? I turned to books, hoping for an answer, but found nothing of use. I asked on the internet, and got a hundred comments that told me to believe in Jesus. I started to think that I would find no solution, and that my sister screaming each night because of a giant serpent at her feet would remain a regular occurrence. Eventually, I did find the answers I needed. Interestingly enough, I found them with a few men that lived outside of Moscow, and only came here for work. They listened to my story and just waved their hands at me. It's a Domovoy! For them, it was as clear as day. They didn't have to believe in those things. They lived them. In Slavic folklore, a Domovoy is a house spirit. He was mostly considered a good being that helped the owners of the house and protected them. It was also said that if a family angered, he might scare them or even toss things about. I had never considered the possibility. But when I thought about what we might have done to anger the house spirit, I remembered how we had rearranged the apartment. We had rearranged the room that was always the master bedroom in the apartment. I told everything to my mother, and we put everything back in its original place. That night, my sister slept like nothing had ever happened. The next day, I walked back to the center of the apartment and said that if something like that was to happen again, I'd call a priest. Now, I realize that I shouldn't have done that. Since then, the only one who has problems with this house's Domovoy is me. Every time I come to visit, one item in my possession breaks in a strange way, no matter for how long I stay. I work in a nursing home. The building is really old, and it was destroyed by a fire before being renovated into the home it is today. I work in the kitchen, so I go all over the building offering cups of tea and food to people. Since I started working there, I heard stories of strange things that are said to happen in the home. In particular, there was a story of the spirit of a woman without legs, who had supposedly been seen drifting along the corridors, passing through walls. I was not sure if I believed such stories. That was, until I started experiencing things for myself. About a year ago now, I was making tea on the middle floor. There was a woman sitting alone in a chair in the lounge, where the corridors meet. She was wearing a long purple dress, and had dark hair tied up. I began to make her a cup of tea, as she sat there, watching me. I felt as though I was being judged in a way, that she thought she was of a higher class than me. In a moment, I brushed this feeling aside, as the home is very expensive, and I work as a student on minimum wage, so many of the visitors to the home do tend to have this attitude. However, the lady didn't even say hello, she just sat there. When I turned to ask her if she wanted sugar in her tea, she was gone. There was no evidence that she had ever been there to begin with. She just disappeared. Since that time, it is like some kind of floodgate has opened and I have experienced several other strange, possibly paranormal things. The kitchen is in the basement of the home. As it is an L shape, it is impossible to see the entrance from the work area. By the door, there is an area to make drinks. Now when I say the basement is creepy, I mean that the majority of staff will not go down there alone. As for me, I do work in the kitchen alone, yet I constantly feel like I am being watched, or that there is someone behind me. I can usually brush the feeling off. That was, until recently, when a salt shaker kept throwing itself on the ground from the shelf by the drinks area. Throwing, not falling, throwing itself from the shelf. At first I thought it was a carer messing around, 
but when I moved the salt to where I could see it, it tumbled off the shelf twice when my back was turned. On other occasions, the box of tea bags has also been thrown whilst I've been there. There is a violence to it, which makes me think that whatever force threw the tea and the salt was trying to hurt me. Sometimes banging and clashing sounds come from the kitchen for no apparent reason, like someone is banging on the surfaces or hitting trays together. The other cooks have said that they have experienced other strange occurrences too. The room gives me the chills. At times I've been so scared that I've genuinely needed an excuse to leave the kitchen. As terrifying as that room can be, however, a more recent experience was scarier still. I believe I have seen another spirit, although this one was clearly malicious. In the morning, the fire door between the corridors is kept closed, as the toaster has the potential to set the alarm off. I was on the middle floor collecting plates from breakfast, and through the door I saw a woman running at me, frantically. She had dark eyes and grey, frizzy hair. As strange as it sounds, she looked like what a kid's film may depict as a witch. As she charged towards me, I froze. I was behind the door and I couldn't move. A part of me knew that this lady wasn't a visitor to the home. She was something dangerous, something otherworldly. She didn't make it to the door, but I didn't see what happened to her. Just like the first woman, it was as though she disappeared. After that, I ran down the corridor as fast as I could with my plates, and I didn't go back up for the rest of my shift. After seeing the woman in the purple dress, and now that wild-haired lady, I have become terrified of the middle floor. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe for more of the paranormal if you have not done so already. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to share. It helps more than you know. And if you cannot wait until my next video, why not check out another on screen now? Remember, the more you know, the more there is to fear.